Thursday on Mansfield Today, and that means we go traveling, or find out about traveling, or find out about people who can travel. We, we do any, you know, we do what you usually do on this show. Any bloody thing we want. Okay, it's as simple as that. Years and years ago, I met a young gentleman at that time, and uh, I, was, I was also young, um, and we've both aged, and we both still feel young, I know. Um, a gentleman by the name of Colin Bell, who had just started a, a little company called... Um, Colin, what, what did the first company, what did you call the first company? So way back in 83, um, we started a company called Wilderness Safaris. We kind of were the sort of... Uh, after effect of the Soweto riots in 76. So this is my last year of university and we had this bloody tumultuous last year and a whole lot of the students were all marching down towards John Foster Square and we got ambushed and all the rest of it and it was hectic. I mean, if we think that fees must fall and all the rest of it was hectic here, my goodness, those days were really, really rough. And I made the decision then to not go and so sort of spend time in South Africa if I could. And so I had two job offers. One was in what was then Southwest Africa, Namibia today, and the other one was to go and work in Botswana as a safari guide. And they were both fantastic. And I remember spinning a coin, and this coin came up saying Botswana. And off I went in 77, my first job, was as a safari guide in the Okavango. And all my mates at university said, well, where's the Okavango Delta? I mean, you say that today and everybody knows they can pinpoint exactly on the map where it is. But in those days, it was this unknown place, wild as hell, crazy as hell. I had the fortune to meet up with a guy called Chris McIntyre, who I still maintain was the best guide ever to be in Africa. And he was just this most extraordinary human being. And I was on the coattails of all his good guiding and his great jokes and stuff like that. And we got to know each other and sort of really respect each other. And when... In 83, we branched out on our own and we started Wilderness Safari. So that was way, way, way back, 40-something years ago. We were two idealistic youngsters. We'd each saved up 2,500 rand. And we, Chris had an old Series 3 clapped out um, bucky. And with the, the, the 5,000 rand and with one clapped out bucky, we started Wilderness Safaris. But then you started progressing into bigger things and you got bigger vehicles and you started overland. You, you were the pioneer of overland tours in Africa. Well, not so much. There were overland companies. There was Afro Ventures and Encounter Overland and all those type of stuff. But, you know, that was nine people crammed into a Series 3 Land Rover and no fridge. I mean, we used to hang socks on our, wood, on our mirrors, uh, long socks, and you put your beers in there and you drip water. And that was the fridge. Yeah. And can you imagine nine people sitting or crammed inside a Series 3 Land Rover with those awful suspensions uh, going out on safari for three weeks? So all we did is we said we had to be the very best we can be. And whatever the market does, we got to do better. And so, we, yeah, we went out with our meager amount of cash and we bought two Ford Control Land Rovers from a military auction. They were all old offices, and we converted them in the back of Chris Mack's dad, uh, Chris Mack's dad's house. And he was a fantastic engineer, very practical, and we were able to convert those into vehicles which you could stand up and walk around in. Everybody had an individual seat. We had a library on board. Can you imagine having a library in a vehicle with all the wildlife stuff? And uh, we also, yeah, biggest thing is we had a fridge. So we could have proper cold beers every morning, afternoon, evening, and it was kind of the, the start of everything progressing in Botswana and pushing the limits upwards and attracting a slightly different clientele. And the big thing we got into was birdwatching safaris. We were able to arrange a week safari, fly in from Johannesburg, flying around the delta, three nights in one spot, three nights in another, for all around about 900 rand. And we put that in, all inclusive, including drinks. And when we put the first advert out, and we could take 16 people maximum, we had people like, uh, who was on our first? I think it was Ken Newman, the bird artist and bird publisher. Yeah. So we had him on the trip, and we had a wait list of something like 50 people. 
And we suddenly realized, wow, we've got a brand new market here. We've, we've got, we're onto something. So our little five grand plus old rusty Land Rover started to see us in good stead. And uh, so the bird watching started and then Peter Stain joined us and Jeff Lockwood, all these great bird watchers. And then we started to branch out into uh, sort of more big picture biology type of safaris and Bob Scholes, the late Bob Scholes, the amazing scientist, one of the best scientists that South Africa has ever produced, he came on safari with us. And we had all these high-profile folks who kind of were the attraction. And over the time, Chris and I got better known, and we started to attract our own following of guests and all that type of stuff. So it started on a sort of upmarket mobile. And then in 86, thereabouts, we were offered a site uh, well, no, we weren't offered. We had this incredible Makoro paddler, a guy called Sarako. Sarako was the doyen of the Bayi paddlers. He lived up in Saronga, and every year he used to paddle throughout the delta. And I got to know him, and he became my lead paddler with his team. And he, I mean, the guy knew the Okavango better than anybody else. And he took me under his wing. I was still in my 20s. And everything I learned about the delta, I learned from him. And we paddled here, there, everywhere. And he told us about this one little island called Kijra, which he called Paradise Island. Kijra, Paradise Island. And he said, this is the place to go and base our camping safaris. And go. And so we approached the leaseholder uh, and we had a sublease to go and set up a little, our little tents. And we literally used to go and camp there. Uh, three nights and then move on all the way up through to Maremi, Chobi, Vic Falls, whatever. And we just got to love Kidra. And that was the place where we decided to get into the luxury market. And we built this camp uh, for 12,000 Pula. And it was at that stage a luxury camp. I wonder if I can put it on a screen here. Maybe I can just find it on my phone, a picture of what the early camp looked like. It was remarkable. We spent 12,000 Pula all in to build this lodge. Hang on, hang on. Um, hopefully, I've got a pick here. Uh, if I don't, I'll find I, it. I went to Kijira when it was being run by Henny. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Henny Rawlinson. Exactly. That's Here it. we go. And So, uh, Henny. That was, a, that was a luxury lodge. Now, look at this. Can you see this there? Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. There, that... This was the height of luxury, Jeremy. This was this was the this is what Henny built for, and we the entire lodge twelve thousand pula. So, and we were now in the luxury business. It was the greatest thing, and it really hung off Henny's character. Henny could sit in the bar all night and tell stories, and people loved it. And by the time they got to bed, they were so plonked with all our terrible red wine, and uh, they could sleep anywhere. And it was the most fantastic start of great things. And today, in fact, last week, I went to the new Kijra. The Tolman family from Red Carnations ended up um, getting the lease, and they spent an awful lot of money, and they put the most extraordinary lodge. In fact, I can put up, show you the contrast. So I took some pics of this lodge. Uh, my goodness. I mean, it's, it's a place of art. An absolute, it's really an, it's a, an art masterpiece. Piece, every single little bit of that place. So imagine going from what we had in the, oops, sorry, let's get this in the right place. Yes, here's, here's your bedroom in the today's Kidra. Oh, hang on, I've got to get to learn to you. Yes, this. Uh, but different Look to at this the place. original Kidra. Exactly. So this Kidra has gone from the transformation from being the very first lodge in the wilderness table to being the Kidra of today and the most extraordinary bits of art and the most amazing thing. I couldn't believe it. We were sitting in Kidra, and they tell me that there's a guy called Sarako working in the lodge. I said, what? Sarako? But that's the old man, and he's late. He died, I think, a year or two years ago. A wise old man. Yeah, they said, no, there's a Sarako here. What's he doing? Oh, he's a young guy coming into work. So I, I said, please bring Sarako over. And sure enough, his name was Molly Sarako, and he is the grandson of Sarko, the original yes. Sarko, the grandson by pure yes. fluke is working in the lodge that his father recommended when we did the very first luxury lodge. And how's that for a nice big turnaround? And I mean, the staff is just amazing. They're all Botswana. I mean, you think about what's ha happened in Botswana with the quality of people 
You know that in those days, tourism was an absolutely ill-respected industry. And there was this massive movement away from the rural areas into the cities. And Botswana started to get, their cities started to overcrowd. They didn't have enough accommodation. They got this, these informal settlements starting because there were no jobs in the north. And then what happened is over time, the country started to really upgrade and started to get into high income, low volume tourism. And it started in about the late 80s, early 90s, where we'd lobbied behind the scenes. You know, the parks were getting seriously overcrowded. You could pay to go to Botswana and pay two pula, two rand fifty a day, and you could have the run of the parks. And that was not creating any jobs. You know, when you're bringing your own food and your own fuel and your own vehicles and you're camping out, you don't create jobs. Mm. So the government turned it around and they went for this high revenue, low volume, concession type uh, tourism where they divided the country up into different concessions, tended them out for a huge amount of money. And the, the interesting thing about the Botswana government model, there's a fixed amount and a percentage of turnover. And the combination of the two ensures that in bad times they always get money, but in good times they share in the upside. Yeah. And this combination of high revenue, low volume, and exclusivity started the new Botswana. And today, something like 66% of everywhere, everybody around the Okavango Delta gets their food on their table through some form of tourism. It's remarkable. Can you imagine if South Africa could do that around Kruger Park? It would be extraordinary if we can achieve that type of level of success. And I'm sure there's some people are grumpy and some people miss out, but that's just normal. But the vast majority of everybody in Botswana, around the parks, around the Chobe, around the Delta, get their livelihoods and their food on their table through some form of tourism. And it's a remarkable story. And as a result, when I went through the camps now last week, you find an extraordinary number of people from the cities who've now moved into the country. Yeah. So you've got a complete reversal of mm -hmm. how people are moving back into the countryside because that's where the jobs are, that's where the opportunity is. And most importantly, that's because the tourism industry has now got status. If you work in the tourism industry, you are in the right sweet spot. And you get these great, young, talented sort of uh, townies from the east getting enthused about the, their wildlife and the environment. And as I always say, if you don't love your wildlife areas, you can never – conserve them. You can never protect them. And we're seeing these young guys from Botswana getting into their wild areas and absolutely loving them. And another thing which is happening, Jeremy, is that because of lockdown, a lot of the real talent in Botswana and Khabarone, they go to Cape Town every weekend, or they go to Joburg, or they go to Dubai, and they've never been traveling to their own country. It wasn't sort of seen sexy enough. And with lockdown, it forced, they had no choice. And suddenly we're getting a lot of these guys traveling up into the into the camps in Botswana, into the wilds, and suddenly you're finding, wow, they've got this extraordinary resource. So we're seeing this sort of industry morph and change over 40 years, all for the positive. It's just been such a wonderful success story. You guys then went to build um, a whole lot of other lodges. You became one of the bigger operators in, in, uh, in Botswana and um, Zimbabwe. And um, were you in Zambia as well? Jeez, no, James. Jeremy. Yeah, no, we ended up running 70 lodges. We had about um, 2.2 million, no, no, ooh, about nearly 2 million hectares of land, which we directly controlled and managed. We employed about 3,500 people. So it was a real success story in seven African countries. But we had a rule. I said all to all our serious guys, on your roof up above your bed, you write no Zambia and no Mozambique. And look at that every single day. And not that I don't like Mozambique and don't like Zambia. I mean, they're fantastic. But uh, to run a business there is extraordinarily difficult. I mean, the government keeps changing their rules. They don't understand privacy. They don't understand high end tourism. And, uh, you know, one thing you do need in, in this industry is certainty. And if you can't deliver certainty. So Zambia is great if you're a, a family and you live in Osaka and you've got an other business in your family and you've got a really nice little couple of lodges. And they, those guys do fantastic business. But for a foreign guy to go in there and try and run a business in Zambia when you've got sort of three, four months of high season and 12 months of costs and a same with uh, Mozambique where the government chops and changes the rules and they take away the concessions and they got this and that. Oh, my goodness. You can't run it as a business. So we, we were in Namibia. We were in Botswana. We were in Zim. And it's strange to say Zim versus Zambia. There's no question. 
<laughs> much rather invest in Zim than in Zambia. Uh, we were in um, Seychelles, we had in South Africa, we had some a nice spread of different lodges. And I left in 2006, uh, 25 years in the hot seat and all the stress and um, yeah, it's time to move on. <laughs> and what happened is the new guys who took over from me immediately went and invested in Zambia and they uh, they'll never get a return, but they now deem it as a conservation project, and they're doing quite well on that front. They're in uh, up in the uh, Basanga Plains, up in Kafui, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So <laughs> they've got their feet deep in there, and they've built beautiful lodges. And for the guests who go and, and stay there, uh, for every penny. Every dollar you pay, they're paying in two dollars. So it's great for the guests; they have a fantastic experience. But for the bottom line, it's quite difficult. What are you up to now, Colin? What have you been doing since two thousand and six? So I made. Uh, so in two thousand and two, the first provincial land claim happened down on the wild coast at a place called the Mkumbati, and. I was. We were asked to come in and invest. Uh, there was a tender process, and the community at around Mkumbati. Uh, I need to step back a bit. In two, no, in 1922, the government of the time needed to find a, an extra leper colony to complement what was happening on Robben Island. I think they might have thinking of closing down the leper colony there, and they went around South Africa looking for the place with the best weather, not too hot, not too cold, not too many people, etc., etc. And they settled on Mkumbati along the wild coast. And that's a little patch of land. If you look at a map and you go south of the wild coast sun or south of Port Edward and you go north of Port St. John's, there's a little chunk of land in the in the map where there's a big void, hardly any roads, hardly any people. And that's where they selected to build the next leper colony in South Africa. They threw a whole lot of people off 18,000 hectares of land and proclaimed that to be the leper colony. They built a massive hospital there and doctor's rooms and all the rest of it. And then when leprosy was cured, it became a TB hospital. And then in 1977, they made a game reserve out of it. And in the new South Africa, as you know, if you were thrown off your land after 1913, when the Land Act came in, which deprived um, all black people of land, uh, except for a tiny, I think it was 7%. So anybody who was thrown off their land after 1913 could claim to get their land back. And so this community were the perfect uh, people to get this chunk of land back. But there was 40,000 people in seven different villages who kind of all had ancestors to this chunk of land. And the way they got together is they created a trust representing all seven villages, all 40,000 people. And that trust claimed the Mkambati Game Reserve and the surrounding lands back from the government successfully in 2002. And the conditions are that the reserved remained reserve and it was uh, lodges were to be built inside there to create the jobs and the revenue and the supply chain industries, which would be owned by the community. So this went ahead in 2002 and we were asked to come and tender because of our track record we really built up wilderness safaris on the back of partnering with communities we didn't have the money so we went and did partnership deals all the way in places like namibia zim botswana all the way around we always had partnerships with local communities and we learned by trial and error on how to make these partnerships work and it is always through making sure that we created a training pro program for locals. We had the right business model where it was a fixed and percentage turnover type of relationship and all sorts of other ancillary benefits. And so we applied that down to, at Mkambati. We won the tender and off we went. But it, through a whole lot of paperwork issues, uh, we've only just started going now. But we made the promise to the community that we'd get involved. And we did, and then after trial and error, trial and error, shoof, my time at Wilderness came, and we were still trying to get that um, Kambati off the ground. Nothing happened, but I'd made the promise. So what happened um, later on, uh, finally I got a call from the community that all the paperwork was done. This is 2012. Can you come back and retender? Which we did, and I suddenly won the, the rights as an individual to go and develop Mkambati Game Reserve, or well, a portion of it. And 
So we've been busy with that. So I was kind of stuck with one lodge. And one thing you can't do in the tourism industry is have one lodge. Because when you market to the world, you've got to have people in every single country marketing. You've got to have people in every city, in Joburg, Cape Town, and all the big markets marketing. You have a huge overhead, but when you've got one lodge, it's difficult. And I went and uh, had lunch with a mate of mine, an ex-wilderness, a guy called Dave von Smeerdijk, and we were just chatting away. And he said, gee, but I've got a problem. I've got a share in one lodge. And I said, hmm, me too. I've got a share in one lodge. And we said, well, over lunch, why don't we put it together? So that was how natural selection started. We, Dave and I started a new company. Uh, we brought in a great CEO, a guy in his 40s, <clears throat> James Ramsey, and he's a, an accountant but understands the bush. And off we went, the three of us, and we raised a, a lot of capital, and we now run 22 lodges in Namibia, Botswana, and one down in Duhup called Lekavata. And um, that kind of – those two little lodges started the whole story. But it meant that – I'm back in the saddle. I thought I could start relaxing and start doing some traveling and all the rest of it. And suddenly this industry is so damn addictive and seductive that it sucks you in again. So, yeah, so we've got a company called Natural Selection, very much geared around conservation. None of us really wants a business for the sake of business. So we've geared it around conservation as the prime objective and working with communities. We've got an extraordinary array of community projects. I mean, during the lockdown, one of our – um, concessions in Botswana is about 200,000 hectares and the, the the landlord is the local community and we ended up still paying over what I think close on 4, four million rand of basic fees even though we didn't have a single tourist we still made sure that the money was paid the community got food parcels all, and we took an enormous amount of time all that sort of wasted no guest time to go and spend money training the Staff. I mean, the guides had a year of walking every single day with some of the best guide trainers, and the transformation of these guides has been remarkable. And the result is that we had almost no poaching. It is, you know, just there was because everybody is still getting paid. Everybody at the the community was getting their cash. It was quite a lesson about the whole issue of making sure that you maintain your your uh, commitments and finances and all the rest of it. And as a result of that, poaching was just about zero. So we've gone back in strong. Um, we're using the sort of COVID time as a chance to improve our relationships with the communities, with the most important, with the travel trade and with our customers. So we back open again. And I must say this year, the bookings are flying in. I mean, I've, you've, when you walk around Cape Town, you just hear foreign accents all the time. I was up in the camps last week, and it's foreigners and South Africans. We've got a really good base of South Africans traveling to our camps. We've got special rates for South Africans so, <clears throat> so they can go to our camps. I think something like started about 4,000 Rand, all-inclusive, including booze and all activities, all that type of stuff. So we've got a really nice little business, but, you know, I'm not – directly on the treadmill. We've got a CEO, we've got proper CFOs, proper accountants and all that type of stuff. And so I'm in the business, but I'm not directly in the coalface. And that sort of kind of gives me a lot more what breathing space to, to enjoy a little bit of life, although we're fully on the treadmill. <laughs> and that's because of COVID. I mean, I've never worked so hard in my life to go backwards, but uh, that's how it all happened, Jeremy. Uh -huh. Colin, it's been wonderful catching up with you. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you very much for taking time out to join us on Mansfield today. Jeremy, luck and keep well, my friend. Keep up the good work and keep smiling. Thank you. Colin Bell. Uh, I don't know what to call him. Madman. I think that would probably fit quite well with him. On Mansfield today. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye.